things off. But does she have, see a show of hands of those of you who've been in front-end engineering for less than a year? Okay. How about uh, between one and five years? Okay. Um, how about more than five years? Okay. And who of you uh, works with Rails? Okay. Who of you has worked with Ember.js? Okay, good. Um, as Peter mentioned, I'm Anthony Bull. I'm senior web engineer over at Crowdflower. Uh, we're the leading microtask crowdsourcing platform. Um, if you know what that is, great. If you don't know what that is, uh, think uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, if you don't know what that is, talk to me afterwards. I can fill you in. Uh, we are uh, we're growing. We're about 47 people. Um, we received 800 million judgments from 4 million plus contributors around the world. Um, and I'll talk about the growing a little bit later. Uh, first things first, I'm going to be speaking uh, with the context of Ember.js 1.0.0.pre.4. Um, there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of volatility. There's been a lot of changes. There's been a lot of growth in the last year, and right now uh, we have very stable um, uh, library in pre four, as we like to call it. I come to you as a practitioner. I'm not a member of the core team. Um, I like you um, use the uh, use a library, use a framework in my job, and uh, I just happen to use Ember.js, and I've had uh, the privilege of using it for about a year now. Um, Sid uh, nicely spelled out MVC. Uh, he alluded to the concept that MVC in the front end is different than the uh, back end. Um, I just want to emphasize that uh, Ember.js MVC is not server side. So if you're coming from server side, if you're coming from a, a web application development perspective, you've been working a little more on the back end. If you get into Ember uh, and you say, hey, this should be like what I know. Uh, you need to check some of those assumptions at the door because it is uh, substantially different. We won't talk about that right now. It's a little out of scope for this slide and at this point in the presentation. Um, but it's good to know. Um, and uh, if you get into Ember and you're a little confused, that's OK. If, uh, if you remember nothing else from this evening, from my presentation and, uh, anyway, at the end of the day, you know, all frameworks have philosophies, uh, all have assumptions baked in. Um, I'll make trade-offs, and uh, I believe in Ember.js as the, the, the best framework that is making the trade-offs um, so that you can build uh, well-factored applications, ones that are easy to debug, ones that are easy to uh, maintain, um, and ones that are easy to add features for. If you're uh, developing ambitious web applications, I really think you should give Ember.js a look. Um, it's really exciting to be here with you this evening. Um, share my love for Ember.js uh, because I've been preparing for this presentation for just over 10 years. Um, <laughs> it's a great time to be in the front end. Um, you know, I, uh, when we talk about uh, single page applications or, excuse me, snappy performant applications, um, model view frameworks, model view star frameworks, controller, VM, what have you, and then um, F2E, front end engineering, all of these concepts are, are mixing together, right? Um, and they have been for quite a while. I started off in 2001 using JavaScript. I was doing some work uh, back in that day with uh, IE. Um, and uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to convey is that my professional growth has kind of paralleled um, trends in the industry um, over these last 10 plus years. And so, you know, I think about the early years of doing front end engineering, and I think about the recent years. And I think about uh, the early years, and I'm, I'm guilty, uh, just like anybody else, of writing a lot of spaghetti code, of, uh, of, of using global variables, of, um, oh, I don't know, um, you know, we, we had to think about events, set up and tear down. Um, if, you, if you're hand rolling your own applications now, if you're doing a lot of JavaScript, you, you still have to do that. I would say you don't need to do that in this day and age because there are plenty of frameworks to choose from. Um, but, you know, 2001 to 2006, uh, I was kind of getting my chops together, um, started using Prototype and Scriptaculous. A couple of JavaScript frameworks came on the scene at the time. Uh, they were good for doing some rudimentary sorts of uh, event setup, um, some DOM manipulation. They were really good. Um, and then I was at Yahoo for uh, three years. Of course, we dogfooded a lot of YUI, um, a great framework. Uh, 
you know, a lot of people, who, who uses jQuery? Yeah, yeah. Um, YUI, a great framework. A lot of, uh, a lot of work has been done uh, by that team making it into a framework that uh, developers can use to be productive. Um, but this, uh, you know, this, this transition from early years to uh, later years to, to recent times um, helps us uh, understand where frameworks have come from and where they're going to. You know, a modern JavaScript framework uh, needs to do data bindings. It needs to handle events. It needs to make that easy for you. Um, State management, if you're doing a robust, ambitious web application, you have to think about state. And it'd be great if the framework could do that for you. Um, data synchronization, you're not uh, living on an island, so you know, whatever you're doing in the front end is going to have to uh, push stuff to the back end at some point, or probably will. Um, and the other thing is, you know, a modern framework should be testable. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I first came into using Ember.js um, early last year at Shopatumi. I was a front-end architect for a brand new product um, that we had a limited amount of time to get to market, and we took a look at a couple of different frameworks, uh, Backbone and Ember amongst them. Uh, Angular, unfortunately, was not on my radar at the time. I, I can't remember why. Uh, there were a number of frameworks then. There are more now. Um, so, you know, we were taking a look at that, and uh, Decided for Ember because out of the box, I could be productive. Um, it was a team of three. I was the front end guy. And so uh, we ramped up quickly on that. I was at Concurrent very briefly doing some prototyping with Ember.js uh, for big data. And now today, I'm at Crowdflower, like I say, with uh, uh, being a senior web engineer. I also contribute uh, documentation to the Ember framework. Um, I'm the Ember.js uh, generator maintainer for Yeoman, if you've used that product before. And as Peter alluded to, I, I teach the Pro Ember.js course at Americana. It's a two-day course. If you like what you have heard tonight, uh, next course is coming up in April. So we'll talk briefly. Uh, and here again, this is my completely biased perspective on comparisons of the frameworks. Um, you know, Backbone.js, uh, I, I will, I must, I must uh, disclaim that I don't have professional experience with Backbone.js, uh, nor with AngularJS, but, uh, you know, I played with them, uh, I uh, evaluated them at a, at a point in time. Backbone, really great for a lot of components, very modular, uh, you can string things to, together as you like, um, building your applications um, as you need to, and I, I, I do appreciate the flexibility of that. Um, you know, the big, the big con is you always have to recreate the wheel, essentially. I mean, every, every new project, maybe you, know, maybe you need that flexibility because you're, 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 you're varying from project to project in terms of the scope of the project. Uh, but uh, you do have to wind up recreating the wheel. And so if, uh, if I were to take uh, uh, Backbone on a, a camping trip, I like to do that uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, not take Backbone on a camping trip, but uh, I like to go camping. And if I were to do it, I would have a, a knife and a, a fork and a spoon. Uh, because Backbone would give that to me to be able to do what I needed to do. Uh, Ember, on the other hand, um, has a core team of people who were, are, contributors to Sprout Core, jQuery, Merb, and Rails. So they bring a bunch of experience to the table in terms of how you should, how you can build web applications, um, particularly for the front end. And so uh, this convention over configuration uh, is distilled a little bit from the Rails community um, and flows through into Ember.js. Um, I think the biggest thing is, like I, like I alluded to, out of the box, uh, Ember is very powerful. Um, you can do a lot of things with it. Uh, the downside to that is um, a learning curve is, is not trivial. You can, get, you can get functional, you can get productive, um, but expect to spend a little bit of time learning. I think it's a Swiss Army knife, like I say. Um, it's an all-in-one. Uh, the framework itself um, is very, uh, uh, very comprehensive in terms of what you'd want to be doing, uh, whether you'd want to be doing data synchronization, uh, whether you'd want to be doing state management, whether you'd want to be, um, well, you, you're going to need to think about your event bindings. You're going to th th need to think about your uh, DOM manipulation, and so Ember takes care of that for you. And lastly, uh, Angular. Um, 
HTML had been designed for apps, not pages. Um, of course, if you think back, you know, 15 years ago, 15 years plus, uh, wow, the internet was a very page-centric uh, place. Now that's not the case, right? We're doing rich internet applications. We're doing single page applications, um, snappy performant applications. And uh, you know, the, the big thing, I mean, it's, uh, it's, got a, it's got a decent sized community. It's got the corporate backing. Uh, there's, there's a lot to be said. There's passion in the community, but there's a lot to be said for having the uh, corporate resources um, to continue that. Um, big con, uh, the verbosity. I, I like the cleanliness of Ember.js in terms of having the uh, uh, the separation of concerns um, to truly have your uh, presentation, your interaction, and your markup uh, separated. Um, and uh, this fork, uh, you know, it's a uh, uh, spoon and a fork, you can get a lot of things done with that. So, enough talking. Let's see some code. Um, well, we're going to see a little bit of code. I'll walk you through a very trivial example. I want to set your expectations where they should be. Um, this is something that uh, is going to be very trivial. I just want to get your feet wet with some of the syntax. So uh, we've got a template. Uh, Ember.js comes with uh, handlebars out of the box. You can use other libraries if you like, but this is a choice that the framework has made for you, um, so you don't have to think about it. It's, is it a trivial choice? Um, I don't know. I mean, there might be a reason. There might be a business case for, for choosing something else, but out of the box, um, it has handlebars. The view, um, don't think of it as the markup per se, think of it as an in-memory representation of the markup with all the bindings that go with. Um, a controller, um, you know, I said it was MVC, I think we've got, we've got a view and controller so far, all we need is a model. Um, we've got a route, uh, a little bit of syntax, might be a little overwhelming right now, that's okay. Uh, this is for state management, and then finally we've got the concept of an object. You put them all together, you have an application. Uh, this is bare bones, and if, uh, if the transition goes well, and bring open, yeah, all right. So uh, yeah, the hello world, uh, there's the application. We've got the initialization essentially, the creation of the application um, at the uh, global namespace level. We've got the object that we're creating, and we're uh, binding that to a, essentially a controller. I don't have any views in there. I didn't instantiate any views, I didn't create any views, so how does the framework know to actually put out something that I see in the browser? Convention over configuration. Um, it's, a naming, it's a naming convention that uh, I'll emphasize a little bit later because it becomes a little more important. But uh, it's good to it's good to know that the, the framework takes care of a couple of things for you. Um, so much like, oh, this is challenging. Okay, so app.set.name uh, sfhtml5. Uh, let's see, app user, sorry. User.set.name. Oh! Does that excite anybody? It did, it did me a year ago. I thought that was great. Um, it's, it's a little less exciting now. But uh, that, you can have, that you can have that sort of programmatic interface uh, to something in the DOM um, and have it automatically update, it's a great thing. Um, so I mentioned it was a little bit trivial. It's OK. Just wanted to get you kind of in the flow of things, that's all. Um, Next demo, I'd like to talk about something that I've whipped together in the last couple of days. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was this like online radio streaming service that you could have, I don't know, stations based on your favorite artists, and then you could like listen to the tracks from uh, those artists? Wouldn't that be great if it were even browser-based? Sounds great, doesn't it? Um, so whipped it together. Um, it's up on GitHub. Uh, who, who can pronounce my username? Incredible. There we go. Brilliant. So, uh, so I, I bring you the Sonificator uh, is the project that I've been working on. And before we get into some of the code there, uh, I want to emphasize the naming. Naming, naming, naming is so very important. Convention over configuration. We have templates, we have views, we have controllers, we have routers, we have models and they follow a naming convention. 
if you mistype, um, stuff doesn't work. And uh, the, uh, the error logging is getting ever better. Um, but you need to be very cognizant as you're getting into the framework that uh, names have meanings. Um, capitalization has meanings too. Uh, one thing, yeah, it doesn't, not in this slide. Um, so let's get into, let's get into it. Okay, so, um, oh, that's a wide screen, isn't it? So, so I'm from Michigan. Um, I've been out of Michigan for a while, and uh, a couple of years ago, I found out that uh, there's like a lot of great music, a lot of great electronica coming out of Chicago and Detroit. Um, so you might recognize Carl Craig and Stacy Pullen. Uh, Carl Craig from Detroit, Stacy Pullen from Chicago. Um, so as I was putting together this app, I was like, okay, what could I do? Uh, I could pull in something I'd be interested in doing, and that is creating this radio streaming service. Like, there's uh, nothing out there like that, right? So um, what I'm going to walk you through is, uh, is stubbed. I don't have any back end to this yet. I didn't get that done for tonight. But um, I'll show you fixtures. Uh, that is the way that I uh, that flesh out some of the data uh, that I can use in the front end in the framework. So I don't necessarily have to have access to endpoints uh, that are serving up JSON necessarily. I can do a lot of independent development before um, tricking out with the actual backend calls. Um, what we'll do is, uh, yeah, we'll just walk through it real quick. So uh, I think, I think it sounds on. Oh yeah, it sounds on. So let's see, so Stacy Pullen. All right, oh, so we've got, uh, we've got this mocked, um, uh, service of uh, doing a callback to a uh, server, having done a search for Stacy, um, getting a couple of tracks, and then, um, then we'll click on one of them. Okay, and oh yeah, we get it to play. Um, yay! No. So, uh, so what's going on here? Uh, there's a lot of things. I'll show you the code in just a moment. Um, this is built with uh, Twitter Bootstrap, uh, using the Fluid layout, uh, with the SoundCloud HTML5 widget, uh, and with Ember.js. Another thing we could do is, all right, if we've got some sort of search box, and we want to be able to uh, look for somebody maybe a little more local, Justin Martin maybe, he's uh, San Francisco based. Um, oh, okay, then we get uh, you know, a new track from him after it comes back from the uh, back end, and uh, you know, same sort of thing. Get right into uh, get right into that track. That might be some good uh, bass, some good background music, but it gets a little more um, drum and bassy, so maybe not appropriate for tonight. Uh, let's take a look at the code really quickly. Uh, let's see, let's see. So let's take a look. Yeah, let's take a look at the uh, JavaScript first. Um, how big is that? Oh, that's fairly big. Well, I'll just I'll walk you down it. Um, very top, creation of the application once again. Um, we've got the setup of our routes. Um, we've got this concept of resource, concept of route. Um, it helps for nesting. Um, if we switch back real quickly to my URL, you might be able to see that we've got this, uh, this pound stations, three tracks, 30. I'll get back to that in a moment, but all of the state is managed in the URL, and that's very key. The framework uh, knows when you enter this route, when you hit this URL, to set up the views that are needed in the DOM. Um, it tears them down as well when you exit that state. All uh, done for you by the framework. Back to the code real, qu really quickly. So, uh, so yeah, so. We've got the routes that we need to set up. Um, a couple more routes. We get to the controllers before too long. We've got uh, we've got some interaction between um, the views in the DOM and the controller. You noticed uh, 
might be tough to see from here, but uh, under the search controller, uh, we've, got this, uh, we've got this interaction with this play where we've got a controller bound to view, essentially. Um, the text box was a search view that's bound to the search controller naming, very important. Um, and so when you uh, press enter um, in, the, uh, in the text field, you've got this change event provided to you by the framework. Um, uh, and that helps you invoke the search, which would actually proxy to uh, the stations controller, which manages the stations that we saw displayed. Goes, does the round trip, comes back, it's the data, pops it in uh, in a collection style, and the stations list would update. So let's see, what else? Uh, I mentioned that I wanted to show, okay, so models. Um, <coughs> models we have here. I'm not going to get in tonight, as I'm running almost short of time. I'm not going to get into Ember Data. That is uh, the additional component that goes with Ember JS that allows you to do the front end to back end synchronization. Um, we have the declaration here um, as, a, as, a, as essentially a template. Um, if we go further down, we can see where I've stubbed out the data with the fixtures just so that I can be productive in the front end without actually having to have the back end endpoints available. Take a look at the markup real quick. Uh, pretty standard header. This is beautiful. This is beautiful right here. This is the single page application. This uh, template, uh, this handlebar provided to us essentially sets up the entirety of the application. We have a couple of keywords. Um, if you're familiar with Rails, uh, partials function a lot like in Rails. Um, but this outlet thing, what's this outlet thing doing? This outlet thing is where the framework takes what it knows about the state that you're in based on the URL and essentially serializes everything into that. Right in. Um, is there anything? Let's see, so, so there's a couple of other things. There's a couple of other, uh, let's see, we've got a couple of other, we've got a couple of other handlebars set up. These are templates that are used uh, in the uh, application. You can see our stations, uh, uh, our stations view. This thing is a view, this tracks is a view, and this currently playing track is another view, and those are bound to different controllers by, the same, by similar names. Um, so what else? Let's see. Uh, that about wraps it up for the demo, I think. There's, um, it's uh, like I say, it's under, uh, it's on GitHub. Um, I don't have the slides up yet. Uh, I'll work with uh, SFL HTML5 to get those up sometime either later today or tomorrow morning. Back to the Prezo. Um, keep in mind, naming very important. I said I'd talk about testing a little bit. You should do it. Um, <laughs> what do I have to say about it? Uh, you know, I've got some, I have some experience. Um, I would say if you're, looking, if you're looking to see how to do it with Ember.js, take a look at the actual project. Um, they have a lot of QUnit tests. Uh, so you can go in, you can take a look at that. Uh, there's a rake file that invokes PhantomJS to actually run through those. Um, it's very informational. I have, uh, I've got about four years of Selenium experience. Um, and uh, Selenium's great. Um, you know, it's, it's beefy. Um, I was looking at the Lebowski gem, if you're in, in the Ruby world, um, which essentially does what I did in two other jobs by cobbling together the scripts you need to have to fire up the daemon and have the test run and shut down the daemon cleanly. Um, but I love, love, love Capybara. Um, discovered PhantomJS and Poltergeist um, a couple of months ago and uh, just cannot say enough good things about them as a headless JavaScript engine to, to use for your acceptance testing. Um, I don't know, I'm, I did say, like I said, Ember.js, they do use PhantomJS in the rake file to actually kick off um, the QUnit tests. So I would say go look there, because uh, I don't actually have much experience with that, but I'm going to need it very soon. Put together a couple of lists of resources for you. Um, as mentioned, uh, I teach the ProEmberJS course in Americana. 
coming up in April. It's two days. Um, click on the link, you'll go straight there. The peep code screencast that came out last week, also a very nice resource to, getting, uh, to get up to speed uh, on the framework, the most recent iteration of the framework. Um, and there are a couple of other uh, videos, Tom Dale, uh, Peter Wagonet, and Yehuda Katz, all from Tilda. Um, they're all core team members of Ember.js, uh, but they're all at this company called Tilda that is doing consulting for the framework, um, and then a host of other links uh, that you might find useful. Uh, I had one other summary for you. Um, I think Ember is great uh, because of the pedigree. I think the people bringing the experience that they do into the framework to help build uh, robust web applications as informed by years of experience. Uh, the community has seen tremendous growth in the last year. Um, I've been a part of that. Um, a lot of, lot of changes in the API, but it's stabilizing now. The stabilization is a big thing in terms of the documentation, in terms of the API, uh, the data synchronization, Ember data, which I mentioned earlier, um, has come a long way. Um, and the conventions baked into the framework to help you be productive uh, with the framework out of the box, I made long strides. Now is a good time to hook the train to uh, the Ember wagon, uh, especially because of jobs. Um, this is not exactly scientific. Uh, <laughs> this was pulled off of Indeed.com. The watermark doesn't really show up as well as it could, but 400% uh, growth in the last uh, year, um, and uh, that's uh, kind of how I got my job. Um, so, uh, oh, speaking of jobs, uh, as mentioned, I'm with Crowdflower. We're hiring. Um, if you like, if you work with, if you want to learn more about Ember.js and you have a Rails background, because we're a Rails, uh, Rails shop, Rails 3, that is. Um, and uh, as I also mentioned earlier, you know, it's a great time to be in uh, front end development because, uh, because of the frameworks and because, you know, JavaScript has really come into its own. In, uh, in the last few years, um, it's, it's hot now, and that's great to see because uh, 12 years ago it wasn't really. I mean, it was kind of, and then the first browser wars ended, and then you know there were other things going on, but resurgence right now. Um, but not only is it a great time to be in uh, front-end engineering because of all these great things happening within the community, but if you join us soon, we have a ski trip coming up in a month. So, <laughs> like I said, great time. I'd like to thank a couple of people. Uh, the ones in bold at the top helped me out in terms of prepare, preparation. Uh, the ones in the smaller font on the left-hand side all have uh, something to do with the core team. Um, and the ones on the right are uh, people who uh, have been active in the community and who I've learned from either explicitly or implicitly with the contributions they've made. Contact information is there. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs>